So today's session on um, smart schedule, I should introduce myself first. I am Melanie Harris, Strategy Director with Complete College America. I have the honor of um, introducing Brad Piazza and Nicole Gahagan. Um, Brad is the Vice President of Learning at Waukesha County Technical College and Nicole Gahagan is the Student Success Strategist at Mount Mayor University. Um, this is a follow-up to our three-part eight-week calendar series that we hosted last year. Um, Brad and Nicole wrote phenomenal blogs about their experience um, implementing the eight-week calendar at Waukesha County Technical College. And so I will drop that link in the chat so that you all can read those blogs. There are also three webinars um, that accompany those blogs. And so I encourage you to check those out. Hopefully, many of you were able to join those live, but I will drop the link in, but I will turn it over to Brad and Nicole. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, I am going to share my screen. All right, there we go. That looks right. Well, um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Like Melanie mentioned, this is part four of our series featuring the shift WCTC made from a traditional 16 week, two semester academic calendar model to one that features five eight-week terms with year-round attendance with summer interim and winter interim kind of tucked within. Um, like Melanie mentioned, I am a student success strategist at Mount Mary University, but prior to that, I worked at WCTC for about five and a half years as a vice president of student services. So I was Brad's partner in crime with this work. Um, the title of our presentation is Smart Schedules, and one of the things we just want to emphasize today is post-secondary institutions' responsibility to create a learning environment that is responsive to who their students are. So at WCTC, when we started to dig into who our students are, rather than who we assumed they were, we recognized that our academic calendar structure wasn't setting students up for success. Ultimately, we realized we had to change our academic structure so that students were empowered to create smart schedules that met their goal of timely completion. So today we'll be providing a really quick overview of how we got to eight week terms, the data that informed that decision. And then we're gonna go into detail about our process for revising the academic maps that shape students' enrollment behaviors. And then we're going to end by providing you our year one results um, of this new academic calendar, which was launched in fall of 2020. And then we're also going to provide some information about lessons we learned along the way and what's coming next for WCTC. So as you might recall from our previous webinars, if you had a chance to review those or our blogs, um, this change was significant and it required the change efforts of everyone in every nook and cranny of the campus community. So one thing that Brad and I like to always make sure that we mention is that dozens of individuals from all facets of WCTC were integral into making this transition to what we consider an academic structure that is more conducive to 21st century student learner needs. So every change effort needs to be done with sensitivity to institutional context. So as a reminder, WCTC is part of a 16 institution technical college system within Wisconsin. WCTC specifically is situated in the county just west of Milwaukee County. So the majority of our students live in or right around Waukesha County, uh, but more and more we have students coming from Milwaukee County to join us as well. The institution has a total headcount enrollment of about 18,000 students, and this is inclusive of students pursuing associate degrees, technical diplomas, short-term certificates and apprenticeships, as well as duly enrolled students and students um, who are taking courses for continued education. Uh, WCTC's full-time equivalency for college enrollment is just under 4,000. So there were a number of drivers that prompted us to consider shifting to uh, more but shorter terms. Um, one of those was, were, was local workforce needs. We could not get graduates into the hands of our local employers fast enough. Um, but then the second was, was individual students' needs. Our students were taking about five years to graduate with a two-year credential, um, or were stopping out or dropping out completely never to return with no credential to show for their time and the effort that they did invest. 
Um, so we knew that we needed to make a change in order to fulfill our mission of providing accessible career and technical education. And when we dug into who our students are and how they were faring at our institution, um, we recognized that our academic structure was not at all accessible to our adult learning students. So around the time we were considering shifting to a different academic calendar, we were also implementing guided pathways. Um, even though the institution was undergoing a lot of change because of our implementation of guided pathways, that work aligned really nicely with what we were thinking of doing with the academic calendar because ultimately those two initiatives had the same goal. And that was to help more students earn a credential in a timely manner. So like I mentioned, we started to dig into, find out who our students are. What was a typical profile for a WCTC student? And what we learned is that the average age of our students was about 26 years old and 75% of our students were working. In fact, half of those working students were working full time. So it was really no surprise at all that 86% of our students were enrolling uh, on a, on a part-time basis. These students were taking one, maybe two classes per 16 week semester, which uh, led them to only uh, earning about 13 credits in an academic year. So as you can imagine, um, it was taking students quite a bit more time than maybe they had initially planned in order to earn their credential. Only about 5% of our students were enrolling in 30 credits per academic year, which would situate them to graduate within two years. So the next question was, how are our part-time students faring in comparison to full-time students? Our academic structure was set up very much with the traditional college student in mind, and that's like an 18-year-old full-time student, which of course, as I just mentioned, that's not the WCTC student profile. So if you take a look at the graph on the left, what we are looking at here is course success by enrollment intensity. The blue bars represent general education courses and the orange bars represent technical courses. And the two bars on the left show how part-time students succeeded in their general education courses and their technical courses. And then over on the right, that represents full-time students course success. Um, we define course success as, as C or better at WCTC. And as you can see, um, regardless of whether we're talking about general education courses or technical courses, our full-time students were um, performing at a, 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 a rate that's about 10% higher than our part-time students. And of course, course success then leads into retention. And so if you look at the chart over on the right, um, the purple bar represents our part-time students and the green bar represents our full-time students. And you can see that our full-time students are retained at a rate that's almost 20% higher than our part-time students. So all this resulted in some fairly lackluster uh, completion outcomes. So uh, it's important to note that this is not iPads data because iPads isn't especially representative of who our students are. This comes from our Perkins cohort data. So what you're looking at here is our three-year and our four-year completion rates. And again, part-time students are represented by the purple bar and full-time students by the green bar. And you can see there is a distinct difference in their success. In the third year, so 150% of time to completion, our part-time students were completing their credential at a rate of 40%, whereas full-time students were completing their credential at a rate of 56%. And then if we look at the other um, time marker there, four years, so 200% time to completion. Our part-time students were completing their credential at only 45%, whereas full-time students were completing their credential at 60%. And so when we started to show this data, um, our, our campus, our internal constituents really started to become intrigued um, because they were learning as we were learning about who our students are and, and how, how they're succeeding or not. And it also caused some uh, discomfort so we weren't comfortable with the fact that less than half of our part-time students who represent the majority of our students were graduating in double the amount of time their degrees were supposed to take. So this really got the wheels turning. We knew that there needed to be some type of change, but we weren't sure what that change um, was going to be. But right around this time, uh, we started learning about Trident Technical Colleges um, transition to eight week courses and the success that their students were having in terms of persistence and completion. And we had about 3,500 enrollments in eight week 
courses at WCTC. So a, a small portion, but enough where we felt we could take a look at the data and compare 16 week course success rates to our eight week course success rates. And so what you're seeing here is um, those success rates for the spring semester of 2019. And um, when you take a look at 16 weeks versus eight weeks, we can see students in eight week courses were faring um, about 10% better in terms of course success than their 16 week um, uh, counterparts. Conversely then, we took a look at withdrawal rates as well. And again, um, same thing, just reversed. We can see that there is a higher rate of withdrawals from 16 week courses and a much lower rate of withdrawals from eight week courses. And when you think about who our students are, right, many of them working full time, 26 year olds, probably have families, et cetera, there's a lot of life that can happen within 16 weeks. So it makes sense that more students would need to stop their enrollment during that 16 week period versus an eight week period. So Brad's going to walk you through um, some details in terms of how we remapped our uh, academic plans for students to help them complete a credential in a more timely manner. Excellent. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Brad Piazza, Vice President of Learning at Waukesha County Technical College, and happy to say that I've got really one of the co-pioneers and drivers of this, uh, along with Nicole. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the, uh, the guided pathway model and, and how it fit into this work or how our calendar work really fit into the guided pathway model. And many of you might be guided pathway institutions um, as well. So the work that we're gonna talk about today and with respect to um, designing these program plans really fell under the domain one work, which is a mapping pathways of student end goals. So if, if you, don't know what Guided Pathways really looks at that whole student life cycle from the point of interest through completion and everything that they're going to encounter along the way. And so the very first domain and, and one of the first things that we tackled is making sure that there is a, a realistic pathway for students to find their way through their programs and to navigate their way through the programs at uh, WCTC. So the work of the calendar um, really is uh, born out of our, our work uh, in implementing the guided pathways framework. So I just want to give you some context in terms of where this work falls within, um, within the domains. Uh, next slide, please. So, whoop, other way. There we go, thanks. So as you all know, in higher ed, we have these catalogs, right? And they have majors in them and we list all the courses that students need to take in, in our system. And some of you on this webinar today might be from our, our Techno College system. Um, know that we would list, you know, first year, first semester, first year, second semester, and the courses that they're supposed to take. And we would just put them in there because we're required to put them in this format. And for a student to get through our institution, they had to take, you know, 15 to 18 credits each semester with running 16 week classes in order to even have a chance of getting out in two years. As, uh, as Nicole mentioned, the, the, the profile of our students is not at all consistent um, with how we have these um, academic maps put together. So one of the things that we had to do was really address that first. And so we spent a lot of time as a college um, in retreats, which are fancy words for longer meetings, um, trying to get uh, the learning managers, so my associate deans and coordinators and deans, as well as our friends and student services, to think about and to learn about momentum metrics. And so we've, we've learned a lot about momentum metrics from you know, Complete College America and other places as well, and how we need to start thinking about the cadence at which students are moving through our institution. So we spent a, a one retreat um, talking about momentum metrics, introducing the college, in particular again to our managers, uh, to what momentum metrics are, why they're important, and which ones that we really want to, to, to start impacting. Then we had another retreat the following year or half year, I forget exactly the timing of these right now, but 
where we started to work with, with my uh, instructional managers on the learning side, looking at their program maps and getting them to look at their program, look at the courses that are in them, look at the prereqs. So, you know, we love in higher ed to prereq the heck out of everything, whether or not they need to be there or not. We like to put them in place really to take a hard look at whether or not those are necessary. Where are your gatekeeper courses, right? We all know that math and English are gatekeeper classes, but when you're an accounting program, we know that accounting one is a gatekeeper class. And so trying to identify courses like accounting one and blueprint reading and things like that, where we know students um, historically based on course success rates have, have struggled a little bit and how we can um, ease up kind of the course sequencing with respect to when those are. So anyway, we really spent time at, at that retreat getting people's minds around these program maps. And so what we did was create a, um, a guideline, and that's what's on the screen, of criteria that we really wanted them to be thinking about as they started to draft what these new academic maps would be for each of their programs. And we gave them, and so the domain one team that I referenced it with the guided pathways really created the criteria for what people need to be thinking about with these new academic maps. So that we need to make sure that students could realistically get 30 credits in academic year, that the academic maps did not exclude summer. We love to exclude summer in higher ed, but in the two year world, um, that's very, uh, that, that time is, is precious to these students to keep moving through our programs. They needed to look at prereqs. They needed to look at the sequencing of prereq to make sure that we weren't sequencing the prereq course after the target course. Course competencies, like we like to shove everything we possibly can into a course and really to unpack that class a little bit and think about what's essential. And that was done with faculty and I'm gonna come back to that in a second common first terms where we, where we can, kind of that meta major concept without calling it a meta major, math and English sequence in the first year, discipline specific gatekeepers like it talked about uh, and so on. So we at this retreat started to get people thinking about that. Then at an in-service um, with our faculty, we really carved out work time for faculty to work within their programs with their instructional manager and figuring out what these maps need to look like based around uh, with these guidelines kind of as those rails that they need to kind of stay between, right? And so we spent a lot of time and I wanna kind of jump back to that course competencies. We had at one of our in-services, um, some of our, our um, excellent faculty who are already doing this type of work, talking, doing this bucket exercise, right? And so you have a, a course and maybe it's got eight to 12 competencies in it, but all eight to 12 don't have the same weight for lack of a better word. So what are those two to three competencies that we know we need to spend the most time on and are the most critical for success in the other courses coming behind them? So you put those rocks in this bucket and then we can kind of fill in around those, right? So really unpacking that. And sometimes you realize that you have the same competencies from course to course to course in the same program. And so getting faculty talking about what they're doing in their courses, unpack the class, redo the competencies, and really focus on those absolutely essential things. Because we're moving from 18, from 16 weeks down to eight. And that doesn't mean you just take 16 weeks of content and jam it into eight. So we had to make some adjustments, right? So this was our attempt at being able to do that. So after the, these, you know, the instructional managers and the faculty spent time on this and working in their in-services, they created a draft of a map. And so then Nicole and I did a first review of every academic map that was done for every single program on our campus. And what we did is we sat down with the instructional manager and just did a first review and provided some feedback. Sometimes we had questions that would get them to think maybe a little bit differently. And we would have questions, maybe something wasn't clear and their explanation made it super clear as to why things were laid out the way they were. After that was done, and if there were any adjustments that we want them to make and all of that was done, 
Then, um, and this was really important um, because as you know, financial aid drives just about everything when it comes to these to programming and, and students, we absolutely didn't wanna build something that wasn't aidable. The director of financial aid and I did the last and final review. So we, uh, Justin is his name, uh, Justin and I sat down with each of the instructional managers, went through every one of their programs to make sure that everything was in, was in line for students to get financial aid, or if it wasn't aidable to make sure uh, uh, that there wasn't a way to make it aidable, or just to make sure that we're all clear on the program not being aidable and still make sure that there was a pathway through for students. So I guess that's a really long way of saying we had to create some really good guidelines for these programs. We, we knew we needed to fit a little bit into a box and that we were going to make sure that this criteria was really looked at and thought about as we created these maps for students to be able to get through our programs. Next slide, please. As part of this work also, and this was really an advising tool, um, but also good for, for the learning side to be paying some attention to. I know it's really hard to see, but I, I just wanna kind of break down what, what you're looking at. Um, so we created these uh, program matrices. And so, you know, this one happens to be accounting. And so what we asked them to do, in addition to creating the program maps, is to list every course in their program and when it was gonna be offered based on the new program maps that they had created, right? So it's gonna be a summer offering, is it going to be a fall one, a fall two, a spring one, a spring two, and so on and so forth. And so we had asked each program to create that map and then to um, indicate if they could, whether it was a day offering or an evening offering. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if it's on this one or not, I think it is, if the kind of the modality, right? Was it gonna be an online class? Was it gonna be a, a hybrid class? Keep in mind, all of this was done pre-COVID. So obviously uh, we continued with the, the offering in, in the right sequence, but the delivery may or may not have changed for these. But this program matrix really, now this is when we go to do scheduling, what we're working, working from uh, when it comes to scheduling, also gives the students an idea with their advisor as to when they can expect um, a course to be offered and the modality by which that class will be offered. So again, we have this for every program and it, it was a useful tool. If you go out to our website, wc2c.edu, click on a program and the course is somewhere in the catalog piece, there's a link to the matrix and you should be able to see one of uh, some of these examples. And so this is something we didn't have before. And many of you may have this already and say, well, that's no big deal. We've been doing that for years. But for us, it was not something that we had. And it really provided a little bit more structure around um, our, our programming and our, our, our way that we wanted students to move through these programs. Next slide, please. All right, so um, I wanted to share some of our Preliminary data. So for those of you that have been with us through some of the other um, presentations, we were doing all of our presentations for CCA about a year ago um, prior to the implementation of the eight-week calendar. For those of you that are first joining us, um, we uh, implemented this in, in fall. And like all of us, uh, I, I don't know if there was a better if that was the best time to launch it or the worst time to launch it, but it is when we launched it. So like every other institution on the planet, we have a COVID year and our COVID year happens to be the year that we tried to pull off the biggest change in the institution's history probably. And so these are the results of the first year. So we did not um, abandon our, our goal of, of launching this in fall of, of 20. So this is our benchmark year kind of um, and I say kind of because I, I have a feeling that this upcoming year, barring any unforeseen circumstances, probably going to give us a much better indicator of where we're at with the eight-week calendar, but this is our data. And so I wanted to be able to share this with you and kind of walk you through some of this so you just can have an idea of, of how we did in our, in our first year. And I'm really looking forward to um, a year of quasi-normal um, with this eight-week launch to, to see how it stacks up against this year. So. 
Um, a couple of things on here that I want to um, point out. I'm not going to spend time comparing us to these benchmarks, but you'll see the WTCS benchmark in each of these boxes. Um, WTCS is Wisconsin Technical College System. There's 16 institutions within our system. So we have these benchmark institutions, kind of our cohort that we compare ourselves against and each tech college has one. And so we have seven and they are medium sized institutions located in medium population density cities. And so within the WTCS there are seven other colleges that we compare ourselves against um, and that's kind of our cohort. So those are on here and quite frankly, um, that's of less concern to me than our um, comparison to the previous year. But it's on here. It just, again, it kind of gives us a, a little bit broader comparison point. And so um, you'll see that, um, and I'm just going to kind of move from the top left uh, across and then to the bottom row. So we had, you know, 34, almost 35,000 course enrollments. So this is from um, summer through uh, May. Uh, our client, so our official reporting, uh, I'll be able to have absolute final numbers in September. So these again are all kind of preliminary numbers uh, as everything's not closed out yet. So we had about 35,000 course enrollments, which is actually up um, about one and a half percent in comparison to the previous year. So that's course enrollments. These are obviously duplicated student counts, but absolute course enrollments, so student registrations and courses. And that's in every modality and it's in every format. I, I should mention um, that not every single course went to eight weeks. Um, some did stay at 16 and there was an explanation given as to why those, some of those made sense. And so while every program has eight week courses in it, not every program is 100% eight week um, delivery. The next uh, box, the course success rate. So this is overall as an institution in the first year, 86.1% course success rate. So this is eight week as well as 16 week. And so some of those 16 weeks are, you know, lab intensive, they might be clinical sites, practicum sites, whatever the case may be. So that's our overall course success rate, which was down 0.3% uh, in comparison to the previous year and our eight week format. So those courses offered exclusively in eight weeks was 84.7% success rate. So um, if you remember one of the previous slides, we had talked about our success rate being up in the 90 some percent. A couple things to keep in mind. Number one, we had faculty teaching in the eight week format that have never taught in this format before. We had COVID and we also had students taking courses in the eight week format who have never taken eight week class before. So I think overall we had pretty good success in this first year, given now that we have uh, you know, before we had 3000 ish course enrollments in the semester and now we have, you know, tens of thousands of course enrollments in, in eight week courses. So that's what our first year kind of benchmark is for course success in, in eight week is, you know, pushing 85%. We had a 7.3% course withdrawal in all courses and we had a 7.9%, so about 8% for eight week format. Again, uh, as I had said before, probably some of the same factors contributed to, to a little bit higher course success rate than we had seen previously. Um, but this was, uh, again, our starting point. One of the metrics, so one of the momentum metrics that we had talked about here and, and uh, is really that average credits per student. And this is one that we really are, are keeping in our, our eye on and, and wanna see the needle move on. So we're at 12.2 average credits per student. Um, so that's up. 1.3% over 2020, which is good for us to see. And, and right now, as we're looking at enrollments for, for um, fall, um, we're tracking very close to that right now. So again, that's one for us, one of our key metrics is we wanna see that needle move, which will obviously speed up time to completion, right? Another one that we had talked about in terms of our momentum metrics is the percent of students enrolled in 30 credits. Um, in an academic year. So we only have, you know, our first year of eight week, it was obviously the year we're just wrapping up. So we had about 5% and that's up, you know, 0.6% from the previous year. This one's gonna take some time to move. Obviously we have to have a few semesters under the belt to probably see any movement in this or quite frankly, a few years, but this is another one of our key momentum metrics that we're looking at. 
And then finally, the, the retention. So we did fall to spring retention. We haven't gotten into the fall one, fall two, spring one, spring two retention. Other than that, we have been looking at the percent of students who register in fall one and also register in fall two at the same time. We've been pushing close to 90%, which is really good because students then can maximize their financial aid. But we had 85.6% um, fall to spring ret retention, which is down 1% in comparison to the previous year. Um, but again, overall, we're, we're pretty happy uh, um, with where we're at with these. So this is what our first year looked like. Again, for everybody, this year is going to kind of have an asterisk next to it. Hopefully, the year that we're coming into now, starting um, actually with this summer, uh, we'll see some maybe more um, accurate numbers in terms of uh, how things are going to look in, in a, again, kind of a quasi-normal, hopefully very normal um, academic year. So after September, when everything is closed out, we will lock in numbers and we will be, uh, be able to share out some additional metrics as well. But I know a lot of people have been interested. I've been getting a fair number of emails after each of these webinars kind of asking how things are going. So this is our first snapshot of, of how things are looking for us right now. And Nicole. All right. Well, of course, with any change, there are happy surprises and lessons learned and iterations being planned for the future. Um, although we launched the new academic calendar in the midst of a global pandemic, um, we were delighted to um, see African American or Black students and students with disabilities gains in course success surpass that of their counterparts. So that was a very happy surprise for us. Um, we thought that we had turned over just about every stone in terms of rethinking every process that supports instruction behind the scenes. Um, and we think we did so with one exception, and that is the grade appeals process um, that is under revision now. Our grade appeals process is uh, laborious and long and cumbersome and probably needed an overhaul anyways, but uh, no time like the present to streamline that and expedite that because there's such a short amount of time in between terms now and students need to know what their final grades are before they can register for the next set of courses in the next term. So that is one process um, that we didn't revise prior to flipping the switch on the new academic calendar um, that we've noticed so far that we need to take care of now. Um, one of the other things that uh, WCTC wants to do is take a look at um, course success class by class. So while having faculty members take a look at the, at the success in their courses. Um, for example, students who were in A&P did better than when A&P was delivered in a 16 week format, but that wasn't the case in microbiology. And so what is it about the courses that aren't showing more course success prior to flipping the switch on the eight-week calendar. And so we wanna dig into that, see if there's anything we can do with the structure of those courses um, uh, to see if we can increase course success. Um, otherwise, we'll have to decide whether or not those courses remain appropriate for an 18-week term or whether or not it needs to be stretched out to, to 16 weeks. Um, last, the other thing that we would like to do, and this is something we've been wanting to do since we started thinking about these this year-round attendance is, allow students to register for the entire academic year. Um, we're not quite there yet because of course there's a lot that goes into creating that possibility for students. Um, but right now students can register for both terms that would typically sit within a traditional 16 week semester. And like Brad mentioned, close to 90% of students are taking advantage of that opportunity and registering for say fall one and fall two at the same time. Again, that maximizes their financial aid uh, award. Um, and so, we would like to open that up to the entire academic year so that students can do some financial planning around that, plan the rest of their lives and external responsibilities around um, knowing what's coming up as far as when their courses are offered. So um, those were our happy surprises and our hopes for the future. And um, now we are ready to take any questions um, that might've popped up. I'm taking a look and it actually looks like you've answered <laughs> all the questions, <laughs> which is perfect. Um, we can give a good 10 second pause to see if 
anyone has any questions, last minute questions to add in the chat or Q and A, or Brad and Nicole, if there's anything that anything else you want to share. Um, but it looks like we're all set. Okay. I would just encourage everyone if they didn't see our other three webinars or read those blogs to go and check those out if you um, are thinking about making a switch to a different academic calendar. We go into a lot of detail about our decision making process and how we engage the rest of the campus community in this work in order to um, get some buy in and, and help um, expedite the change process. Perfect. Yes. And I just dropped the link again in the um chat box and we'll also include it in the recap email but it's been great seeing all the progress you've made um, over this the crazy times of COVID and everything else that's happened in this past year and still seeing that your numbers have increased so I want to thank you both again for being here today um, I also want to thank all of our attendees um, I have put my email address up on the screen. Um, again, we encourage you to connect with Complete College America on our website and social media and join us for our next CCA Live in two weeks on Thursday, July 30th at 3 p.m. on Proactive Advising. We'll have a panel of phenomenal leaders in the proactive advising realm um, to join us. And so again, thank you so much. And we will be in touch with the recording and the evaluation. Thanks, Brad and Nicole. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.